I think Islam hates us. They have done nothing except wreak havoc and terror for our faith and our religion. When we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. Foundations of society are fragile. We must be the shepherds of our own civilization. If anyone answers either yes or no without making necessary distinctions, both are not telling the truth. They're lying. Father, we pray that your word will become a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. That you will raise up in this nation pulpits and prophets that will call the nation back to repentance. Will you distance yourself from those who think differently or will you join us at the table and talk about what is really important? This is the Maida Initiative. Conversation without compromise. I, I think that the kind of conversations between cultures and worldviews is something that needs a lot of time and thought to talk about, right? That you, you've got to have nuance if you want to understand the differences and the similarities and everything going on in the world. And these kind of topics don't lend themselves very well to kind of five minute sound bites. Right. So our kind of invitation is for people to come and think deeply about these things and enter into that conversation and learn how to have more than just, you know, these scripted answers we tend to have when we meet people who think differently than us so that's kind of the premise that's great so tell me a little bit about your story because you're originally which part of syria are you from how did you get to the u.s i'm from damascus so the capital um a lot of fun background story my my whole father's side are here my aunt and uncles they came back in the 70s, but uh, they applied for us in in 86, and my dad refused. He's like, no, my children are young. I don't want them to grow up in the Western. I want them to have a little bit more, you know, stronger connection background to the culture and the religion and everything. But they kept it on the back shelf, and, and eventually we got the paper 17 years later. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> there were different things. Like I think at the time my grandmother passed away who applied and, you know, if mother's bringing her last kid behind, like who was left behind is faster. But then she passed away. Then my uncles took over again and there was some mix up in the papers and then some political events happened. And long story short, it took 17 years. So I was actually 19 years old when I came here versus two. And my whole life, we're like, we're preparing mentally and emotionally to come, you know, and we're going to live in the States, we're going to come, even though my father at the time was like, no, you know, we might go for a summer vacation, but we're not changing. Like, this is where my life is, my work, I built an empire, I'm not going anywhere. But then when we came here, we got a little taste of this. And we're like, we're not going back. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, oh, I think that this is where we're staying. And it was a little tough on them because he felt like he had to build everything from scratch. Yeah. Like when we came here, we had just packed our summer clothes. So he had to send someone, you know, kept communicating with people to sell the house and close up the store and, and all of that. So, like, basically starting everything at an older age was not easy for him. Yeah, right, 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 yeah. right. But, I mean, it felt like home because my cousins were here, my father's family were here, but we still had a lot of uh, connection because my whole mom's side is in the Middle East, and my mom's one of 16. So, wow. yeah. Tons of cousins. Wow, yeah, that's a, that's a that's lot a of siblings. big family. Yeah, well, I mean, they're all over the world, and with now specifically even more all over the world. Right, but right, right. Yeah, so it was, we were torn. We were torn because we had, you know, cousins here that are more Americanized. It wasn't that cultural connection as much, but we lived, we had sleepovers with like 20-something cousins in, in a small room, and we loved it growing up. So that was the thing that torn us. So we were still connected. I get a lot of people ask me, how could your Arabic be still so on point? And I've been here for 17 years now. It took 17s to come, and I've been here for 17. And I tell them, I said, the connection. We're you know still connected to the background. We visit. I used to visit once a year with um, the recent events that happened. Not so much, but it was just faithfully once a year would go back and, and visit. So... 
That's really impressive. Like I moved here from England and I barely even speak British anymore. <laughs> so English for me is my second language, but I also did uh, work on it myself. So I never went to school here. The only thing I did was going to cosmetology school, and that was a couple of years after. But until then, I started working. I had my first job at um, McDonald's, and I took it and started speaking English. I taught myself English, and I'm a people person, very social. So I would make mistakes, and I tell people, please correct me. And a lot of people ask me, how do you learn English? I'm like, movies with subtitle. Just read it and hear it at the same time. So I taught myself the language, and I took it and read it. It was like within two years, I was speaking just as well as I'm speaking now, probably. So I need Arabic TV recommendations then, because I've been trying to learn so. Arabic through Duolingo through the lockdown. I and think the TV is better. You're probably right. I've uh, I've got the alphabet down. That's great. But most of the time, because occasionally there's still some like literary trick that's right. like when this word and this word is together, you draw this line like this. I'm like why? Right. So <laughs> there there are so many rules, and especially with tashkil, which basically fatha dhamme kasra is the little accents you put on the letters. It changes the way to pronounce it. But um, I think if you learn, and as part of conversation, then the grammars and those rules will come into place yeah. so much faster and easier than learning. Because so uh, in my in my experience, and I can only speak for my English learning experience, which is a completely different alphabet. So probably for you would be the same, not like learning another in, another language where the alphabets are similar. So I actually started realizing rules or making rules for myself, like car and care, for instance. The E at the end becomes softer, and it's not a car, it's a K. So I made those rules to myself as I'm learning. Comes There was actual rules in there. So I figured out things, I figured out patterns in language, and only you could do that from listening and paying attention, taking notes. I think if I went to school to learn it, I probably wouldn't have gotten it the way I did. So that goes for any other language. You just have to figure out patterns and, and learn it on your own then if you wanted to take those classes or those apps that don't make sense. Right, right, right. Occasionally I find patterns that sometimes not. Like there's times that I think Arabic is such a kind of wonderfully intuitive language that once you understand some fundamental principles, it all makes sense. Other days I feel like it's designed especially to mess with people that don't understand the language already. <laughs> Well, are you learning the proper Arabic or the the, the slang? Or I'm, I'm learning the slang Arab. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that'll I'm... get you, you know, well, faster probably conversation wise than speaking the proper. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like my understand like all these places that teach formal Arabic. It seems so unless you're going to be doing literate literature. Right. Like why? It would be. It seems like the equivalent of somebody like moving to America from China and like learning Shakespearean English. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, if you were to spill, well, they, they said the, the formal Arabic is because it's the universal they teach in all countries and schools. So people actually learn it to communicate with each other. But now with the slang, like I said, the Egyptian is a little bit more universal because of the, the media and the TV. If you speak, probably if you learn Egyptian Arabic, you that'll take you everywhere. You don't even need to use the, the proper Arabic. Right, right, right. Most of the main dialect I'm trying to learn is actually the Saudi dialect. I've just had some weird adventures in that sort of space, so <laughs> I, that's been the dialect I've been I've been trying to learn. But that that is a story. That's a that's a longer story for another day. Have you been to any of the Middle Eastern uh, countries? So I have been to in 2014. I went to Israel and Palestine on a family trip. In 2017, 2018, I went to um, Dubai. Nice. Which was which was great. I was there for a I was there for a conference. I was it was mostly a, a part of conference of Arab Christians who kind of translate Christian resources into Arabic, because often what happens is if you're a Christian in a Arab context, sometimes there's not necessarily a ton of resource, right? So in order to have any kind of community and teaching, it's like learning a different culture rather than just a different set of ideas. Right. So 
uh, it was people who were trying to put uh, embody kind of the Bible in not just um, formal Arabic but Arabic dialect, so people could kind of understand it more easily. And then on my way back from there, I had a three-hour lay. I had a seven-hour layover in Istanbul. Nice. And so I, I took a train. From the I got, went through customs, took a train, went to went downtown, went and saw the big covered market, the bazaar. I went to the Hagia Sophia and the the Blue Mosque, and then had some Turkish coffee and baklava, and then had to go back on the train and catch the flight again. <laughs> well, that was awesome. It was un, unplanned, but it probably had had it been planned, it wouldn't you wouldn't have gotten all these little experiences all at once so quick. That's like you got a whole lot of culture within a layover. That's awesome. Yeah, it was overwhelming, and it's such a different experience. Have you been to Dubai before? I have been to Dubai. I've been numerous of times. Actually, um, at one point of my life, I was planning to move back to the Middle East and couldn't find anything better than Dubai to go, and I have family there. So I went and I spent a few weeks in Dubai, and I was supposed to come back, but then major life changes, events happened, and I was like, maybe it's not the time. And I actually used that Dubai is not ready for me when they're like, oh, you're not ready for Dubai. I was like, Dubai is not ready for <laughs> me. <laughs> well, for my experience of Dubai and Istanbul are like complete opposites because almost everything in Dubai is super new. But, but also the country kind of feels like a hotel. Like so, a civilization new, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but in, in some ways, like the... the like Dubai itself just kind of feels like a, a giant hotel. Right. That there's, there's like very few Emiratis there, right. except at the tourist attractions, right? So it feels like the Emiratis are the sort of like wealthy but distant hotel staff. Right. That everyone else is just visiting. That is so true. Where, where is Istanbul? Istanbul was the exact opposite. I mean, people have been living there continuously for thousands of years at this point, and you can just see it on every street. You you look one way, and there's something from the Ottoman Empire. You look at the sort of the wall below it, and it's from the, like the Roman times, and it's it's crazy. So another fun fact: uh, I haven't been to Istanbul, but recently, and thanks to my father for casually bringing this conversation up, that we were actually Turkish background, and I didn't know until I was in my mid thirties, and I was wondering why I love the culture of the Turkish culture. The music, the food, the language. I was even teaching myself, watching some soap operas, teaching myself Turkish. That's not a rare thing, by the way. Really? I have several Arab friends who watch Turkish soap operas and learn Turkish that way. The, so in in Syria, to be exact, the, the last few years, the Turkish soap operas blew up, but they were doing a voiceover. So you'd watch a whole Turkish series with Syrian voiceover so it's, it felt like they were just watching it you know their own actors or people making those series excuse me but i chose to do it the turkish route so i went on youtube found the same series in turkish with english subtitle again that's my comfort zone of how i learn another language and it made sense sometimes people ask me do you think in english or still think in arabic or dream or etc i said no i think i start singing thinking and singing thinking in english and while i wanted to learn another language it sounded better to translate it in my head to english to digest it than to arabic hmm. so that's that's another point for you, you definitely t start watching um, arabic soap operas maybe you'll pick up a lot faster but yeah i just recently found out we're about three generation syrians but turkish before that so i'm so excited i can't wait so first opportunity I want to go to Turkey and find my uh, my roots. Yeah, do you know what part of Turkey that's I have on? no idea. <laughs> that's the thing. One of the oldest, I think, uncles, the only one that, that had the family tree passed away. And all the kids are all over the world and no one really cared to continue the thing. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time. But that brings it to my last name being so different. So anyone who I meet who is Syrian, you know, and I tell them my last name, they're like, Hmm, that's not like Syrian. I'm like, what is it then? And then my dad was like, oh no, dad, we're Turkish. I was like, thanks, dad. That would make sense all my life. I was just confused. <laughs> I I mean, Syria has a lot of diverse history in there. So uh, I have a Syrian friend, Johnny Basmaji, 
and that's an Armenian last name. Okay, we yeah. have them in uh, Aleppo, Halab. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty sure that I'm uh, pretty sure that's where he's from. So, I guess I guess the kind of biggest question I have is how the heck did a Syrian woman end up in the U.S. military police? I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like it's the most common asked question you know like i don't know why would you think that <laughs> <laughs> also what is the u.s military please <laughs> <laughs> so um the u.s military police or the law enforcement in the military um i've always wanted to become an you know an officer in law enforcement i like helping people in distress that was just growing up that was like so cool to be a police officer and it was so far it was like a, an ultimate dream that will never come true you know being my father is uh is, i'm not gonna say strict but you know we are a heavily practiced muslim family that is so cultural involved and religion involved and you know they weren't the parents to just let me go and have a job let alone job in a male dominant profession or God forbid political position or the US Army. <laughs> so I mean, it's a big deal and I usually say so casual. I was like, yeah, I'm an MP. They're like, Do you know how big that is? I'm like, I know. <laughs> it only took like my whole life to finally make it happen and make it come true. It started by, like I said, coming to this country. We wanted to stay here and I became a makeup artist and hairstylist because it was appropriate, you know, profession for Middle Eastern Muslim female in the Western. And it always, I always had it in me. I was like, I, I just want to be a cop, you know, watching the Law and Order, Criminal Justice, and all these shows. And and they just joke, you know, they're like, okay, you're at least you're getting something out of your system by doing that. But I kept at it. I, you know, I had a rough few waves in my life and events that. I try to bring it to the table, and it just, like, got pushed off. Like, nope, you're not doing that. You're not doing that. But at the very, very last minute, I was in New York before here. And um, I went to the NYPD, and I applied, and I got in. But the cutoff was 35, and I was 34 and a half. And I needed, like, 60 college credits. Some of the things that I needed to do, no way it will be done within a six-month frame. They're like, unless you have two years, you know, service in the U.S. Uh, armed forces, but it has to be f full time active duty. I was like, bet. I went and I did it. I went and signed up. And then I told my parents, I was like, ta-da. <laughs> I'm not going to say what happened after. <laughs> but they didn't take it so softly. But um, yeah, I ended up because I really wanted to do it. But the irony here is I spent about a whole year in training. And I mean, I got injured plenty. And it was not easy at someone in my age. Usually people around that time is when they retire. So just I kept my goal, my focus, that I'm a Middle Eastern Muslim female that is in the wrong profession, but I'm going to make it right. I'm going to show that, you know, doing all of that, it's not going to take away from my identity or who I am or who I was, you know, or who I came from. Um, if anything, I'm going to use it to shed the light that, you know what, I want to pave the path for other females to follow. We can do this without, you know, losing our religion or, you know, I can still practice. And they often ask me, you know, how do they disrespect you? Do they? I was like, no, it's zero tolerance. The military has zero tolerance, um, equal opportunity, they, they respect all religion. And the U.S. military is a melting pot from all different cultures and, and different religion backgrounds. You know, there is no certain race. We're all green. We all wear green. And that's what we share. So I I kept at it. And, and after a year, I got stationed here on the other side of the, the world, the, the U.S., you know, from East Coast all the way to West Coast. And then they were like, oh, if you want to become a Seattle PD, you don't have any age restriction. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm here, I guess. <laughs> so if I leave the Army, I was thinking to go and still into the law enforcement route. But it's funny how these things happen. I would have never guessed I'm going to end up in Seattle or Washington. 
to try to rush and get into the military to get into law enforcement. I guess that was the only thing that that state was doing. <laughs> wow. I mean, that, that, is, that is such an interesting place to be right now. Because on the one hand, right, you've got the sort of culture and society you're coming from to deal with. And now this is such a great time Absolutely. To, to be a police to be officer, right? <laughs> It was that's exactly the conversation that we were having. They're like, "Are you still on the on the, on that track? Are you still doing?" I was like, um, "I'm in the I'm I'm in military police right now. Let's just take it one day at a time." You know, I I still have a two and a half years on my contract. It's my first contract. I'm doing four years active and then four years uh, reserve after. Well, they it's not really reserve. It's called inactive, so it's like on call basically. So we'll see where uh, politically standing in the next two and a half years and next six and a half years and see how it goes well the, I'm, I'm sure you'll be fine because ultimately right if anything there's going to be less people wanting to be police officers right yeah. now so there's probably going to be a high demand for for competent people that's exactly what was happening a few months ago so before this whole outbreak of the COVID-19 coronavirus and, and all of that action that's going on um, when I looked into SPD when I got stationed here their retention is a little low so I'm assuming the retention a lot lower right now and they're doing bonus if you sign up and all these incentives um, so I haven't checked since then but I think that's going to be a lot more incentives and you know trying to recruit people yeah yeah wow you're you're in an interesting place so what exactly does the military police actually do so aside from being a military police corps my specialty in the military, uh, in the U.S. Army, is correction. So we are the correction specialist, c correction and detention specialist that we work at um, military prisons. So anyone who is in the military in general, regardless of which branch, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the you know, so forth, if they break the law, committed a crime, and they get sent sentenced, they get sent to a military facility. So they become um, inmates at a military facility. It's not just regular prison. So that requires staff and requires police, um, escorts, um, guards. So we are the small percentage within the small percentage. So fun fact, the MPs are the less than 1% of the military. Wow. It's the same as regular police. It's not the most glamorous and wanted job. So retention is very low. So the correction specialists and the detention specialists ourselves are the less than 1% of the MPs. So imagine that so we are the less than 1% of the 1% of the military. So that that's right there. I think for me, I, I'm proud of you know, have made that accomplishment. I didn't just take the easy way, easy route. I actually love the challenge and I, you know, I wanted to really pursue my lifelong dream and helping people in distress and caring for people. So you, you mentioned earlier that people regularly expect you to face kind of discrimination in the military, but you're saying that's not what you've experienced. It's not at all. Um, if anything, we recently just had Ramadan and my whole first line um, asked me if there's any accommodation. There is a memorandum that comes out from higher ups. It states whoever is practicing, whoever is um, um, needs, you know, extra accommodation or ob observing is what I was looking for. Whoever is observing Ramadan or any religious holiday, um, there's got to be certain protocol taking in consideration we still need to be mission ready. So we, you know, we're not slacking, but if anything, if like, for instance, in my situation, um, if I needed to take time to pray, I'll get, you know, mandatory someone to cover for me with ease, uh, without even making me feel some type of way. Um, they s switched my schedule from the evening to the morning um, for Ramadan because I was observing and fasting. So I can get home at a certain time, make food and eat. Um, there's, I mean, I'm not saying there are no, you know, instances of discrimination. There is, it's, I'm not painting a perfect, you know, picture, but 
the military itself has zero tolerance for that. So God forbid that happens to me. I have the open door policy where I can go and knock, you know, let my first line know, but knock on um, the commander's door and talk to them and tell them what's going on. And they will face consequences for that. But in my experience, you know, being always, I'm not going to say attacked, but there are always some rough questions that comes to me, pointing fingers, saying, um, how much money did they pay you to join the infidels? Or like, <laughs> did you sell your religion to do this? Or did you let go of your citizenship to become American? Or the main question I always get and is very, very recent is, how are you speaking Arabic and you're wearing the U.S. Army uh, military uniform? I'm like, I am Arabic. <laughs> like, <laughs> you don't just put it on and have it to choose a language, press a button. It was so unheard of and so out of the ordinary. And that's what makes me even more excited on day to day basis to be where I am right now. And it pays off for everything that I've been through. And I tell them, I said, the U.S. Army is not at, is not at war with a religion. They're at war with countries. Same way they view us all as Muslims, all Middle Easterns, but not all Middle Easterns are Muslims. Not all Arabs are Muslims. And I'm also using the same tactic to let my battle buddies know that we're not the way we're portrayed at social media. We're not terrorists. We're not mean. We're not bad people, you know. And I have changed. Even if I change one person, I'm happy. I have changed a lot of people and their perspective. And they're like, no offense, but do you mind if I ask you a few questions? I was like, please, I'm here representing. Let's go. Anything. Ask me anything you want to know about the culture. You know, they think that we come from what they see on TV. Like, no civilization. We wear, you know, like, clothes that are broken or, or ripped. Or, I'm like, no, we actually have civilization. We have internet. <laughs> we have everything. So. And, um, yeah. The, the army is, has been um, exactly what I expected, um, if anything, more, because I didn't think that I was going to be having a lot more leeway, you know, with the religion. I know I didn't, I'm not going to shove it down anyone's throat, but I don't think they're going to actually tap me on my shoulder. Like, hey, is there anything I need to do for you? You know, anyone bothering you? Is it, are you having what you need by, by all means? And, and it was really, really eye opening experience. And I try to bring all of that and translate it to um, my friends and followers on social media because I, I like to present that I am a strong Arabic independent Muslim female that actually decided to go and work and you know struggle and be in a position where it's usually not so welcomed, but also prove that, hey, like I'm trying to bring you guys along with me, trying to make a good name for ourselves and try to change the way they think about us. So I'm curious how that plays out on you because I think one of the largest issues in the Muslim world right now and the Middle East in general that you do not seem to be a victim to is kind of groupthink, right? That you, you kind of have, it's very difficult to kind of break ranks and come with a different idea or a way of approaching things sometimes because... Well, you're not a scholar. You don't have the right to kind of like make these kinds of decisions. You're kind of breaking with things. So how do you personally um, have a world uh, have a worldview that allows you to kind of like make these very individualistic decisions in a lot of ways? Um, I'm not really following the, the question. You mean to the military or to... Just, just kind of everything, right? So obviously you, you're... Chart, if, if something in the if, if an issue in the Middle East is that people are afraid to kind of break ranks, if you like, with everyone else and kind of do something new, right? And sometimes religion is used to justify that, with right? People, right? So, uh, so how 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 have you thought about things differently that has allowed you to make these? decisions where you're just kind of doing things on your own uh, surrounded by people questioning and criticizing and how have you charted your own path despite all that so aside from having a really you know strong personality um i'm really i'm, I'm very cultural 
and if if I can, you know, hum being humble to say that I love to represent. So I'm usually the first one at an event, speaking, trying to bridge the gap, trying to bring people together. So it wasn't easy. It still isn't. And to feel like I have that responsibility on my own shoulders. Um, every day I go at it. And what keeps me going at it is the people that are supporting. So not everyone was supportive in the beginning, but now I notice with social media, I have a lot more support when they hear my story, when they hear why, because the first thing they look at me and they judge. So trying to have that support system behind me and, and focus and just really use my religion the beautiful way instead of being an extremist and having you know opinions and trying to put my opinions that lead by example I was lead by my by example so I I mean we all responsible we all have responsibility no matter what the percentage is and I feel like if I have to be the less than one percent of the one percent of the Middle Easterns being in such powerful position I have you know I'm, I'm like cameras on all the time anything I do uh, it's going to represent a whole race not just an individual. And in the military, it's it's not about you being an individual. And that also helped me and skilled me and sharpened me in a lot of ways and opened my eyes to see that I have a role, but that role is affected by whoever is around me, my whole team, but also anything that I do affects my whole team. So if you, how does, how does your belief in Islam affect the way you do your job? Um, a lot of the military values are very similar to Islamic values. Um, selfless service, it's in the same thing. Courage, um, just being, doing the right thing, integrity, when no one, even when no one's watching. All of those things are definitely in Islam. And if you really look at it that way, and the way I am, you know, I may not be the perfect Muslim or portray the perfect Muslim, but alhamdulillah, I pray, I read Quran, I fast, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best to do things where 100% of the time I'm doing it because Allah's watching and, and all of those things I do it has consequences. If, if all of us would do that, which I do, speaking for myself, I use that on day-to-day -day basis, and I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm trying to just support myself working. Um, aside from all of that, what the message is I'm trying to do is the job. So I wake up and go. I do my job 100%. I have integrity in my job, doing the right thing, and then I come home. But also, in the times that I'm not at work, I'm trying to give a message. So being Muslim, it's not in the way of me doing this culturally it is so the way the culture views the female the way the culture views the things that female can and cannot do is completely different from the religion and being in the army it, it has i personally have not broken anything religious you know and religiously i don't eat pork and there is all of those exceptions in the military where if you don't eat pork we're, we're gonna excuse me we're gonna respect that um, when my friends go out on the weekend and, and they drink, I don't. So it's not just because I went there that means I'm disrespecting my religion or I'm dis disrespecting my culture. It is on me, and I'm usually very aware of those things, and I'm trying to make everyone else understand that I am trying to represent it in the best and purest way possible. So it sounds like your life is really exciting, but it also sounds like it would be exhausting sometimes. It's exhausting. It's more... So the exhaust is there. Um, like I was saying earlier, I have acquired quite a few injuries. I just got out of surgery yesterday. <laughs> um, I had another surgery uh, March 9th for my wrist. It's all injuries related to the high-intensity training in the military. So mm -hmm. even when I'm not at work, I'm still suffering from you know the, the toughness of this whole career but mentally I'm always thinking also of ways and I'm always being approached and why doing this and why doing that and I decided 
it was the right thing instead of trying to get those one at a time people to actually get up to the mic in front of the camera and say hey guys look at me i'm in the u.s army uniform and i'm speaking arabic come at me ask me all the questions and let's let's just you know use it to make it as a gate and opening and eye opening and as you're saying it's exciting and exhausting it's a lot more exhausting but the excitement make up for all of that so i get a couple of girls that tell me you're li- you're living the dream that i see at night and as soon as i see that comment it just everything pays off i get a lot of girls that are like oh my god you're my dream walking on two legs you're exactly what i want to do or i want to do or like i want to be you when i grow up <laughs> some sort of thing and that that little excitement right there makes up for everything else. So yeah, and, and I imagine that the criticism is public, and most of the praise and thanks are private. Probably, yeah, pretty much. Right, so the, publicly, you're gonna be like, "How dare you do this?" You know, how woman in the military, Muslim in the military, traitor to Islam, Israeli spy. Have you got that one yet? Oh yes. I oh have. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have. <laughs> I, I think there, there's, there should be like badges for. Uh, things you get accused of by talking about. I'll have like, all the medals. Religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have these even publicly. We should make some like actual trophies. But the Israeli spy badge is pretty elementary. It's just like a quick go-to. Absolutely. And you know what they tell me when they're like, "Oh, how do you speak Arabic?" So this is how the conversation goes. I'm like, "I am Arabic." They're like, "Oh, you must be Christian." And that is that offensive. That is really offensive. And I'm like, "Hey, hey, hey! What's going on here?" Half of my friends are Christian. A lot of my, you know, close friends are Christian. It just because I'm a Muslim or there's just because I'm Arabic and made the, you know, I was the different, the the one person that was the, the, the different in the bunch and crossed over and I became a U.S. Army soldier. I have to be Christian. There's no way. Like, so they're, they're trying to eliminate the factor that there's no way she could be Muslim and she could do this. And, and I'm like, but aside from that, that's really offensive. Like, no, I'm proud. I'm a proud Muslim who practices and let them know that I am too. We had, um, during this whole quarantine thing, we were put on a mission to work the supermarkets and the PX and, and um, the hospitals to do medical screening. So they would need a medical um, medic profession from the military, and they need two MPs with them. So we spent it at standing, uh, you know, um, interview stands in front of those buildings and they come in we make sure that they sanitize their hands they have a mask on so this was a whole different experience in the, in the military it was, it was great and uh, they don't have any symptoms cough fever shortness of breath or anything like that and then we let him through so we get people on the weekend that are in civilian but they're higher ups and I had no idea who this person is and they approached me and they actually wanted us to, wanted to buy us coffee and it was during Ramadan and a fasting so the, uh, the sergeant that was with me, um, you know, first of all, we're like, thank you. We are, we're good. We really appreciate it. They're like, no, no, we know that you're good, but we really want to. So we're like, we looked at each other. We're like, yeah, okay, sure. So they're like, come with us and to choose what you what you want. And they came back to me and I'm like, thank you. I'm, I'm really good. I'm fasting. I could have just said I'm good. I don't want anything. So fast forward, my friends were like, well, you could have just taken it. And drink it later. It could have been anything. I was like, well, no, I'm proud to tell them that it's a certain month that I'm observing. And I really appreciate it, but politely declined by saying I'm fasting. Um, So they go and they actually put it on a gift card for me. They're like, we're so sorry. We hope that we didn't mean any offense to you. We had absolutely no idea. Here's a, a gift card and treat yourself later to something. Come to find out this was the command of the whole base. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then they give me, um, uh, like it's like those uh, army coins, military coins. He was from the Air Force, actually, because we're on the Joint Air Force Base. He gave me this, and this was a huge deal. I mean, like our higher-ups, it went down the chain. They're like, please just let her know that her, her work is appreciated. And now everyone knows that I'm Muslim, <laughs> even the ones that uh, didn't intend to. And these little things is what really is, is, is the highlight of my day, and it makes everything worth it. You know, we've been essential this whole time. Everyone's quarantined. We weren't, even though we weren't working the prison, but we were still put on different assignments. And I would still proud to say it's like 100 percent 
you know, 24-7, like you said, it's exhausting and it's a full-time job on top of my full-time career that I have. But I am really seriously trying to bridge the gap and trying to let them know, like, hey, guys, we can we can do this, you know, and also trying to help by eliminating how they always think the Middle Eastern females have no voice. They have no, you know, uh, choices. Like, no, I'm I'm pretty much Syrian. I'm, I'm the black sheep here. <laughs> I'm the Syrian female, the Middle Eastern female. That's probably not anywhere near where I'm supposed to be right now. But uh, here I am. I'm here. Well, what in my experience, if you if you meeting women that come out of Middle Eastern cultures, because there is so much opposition, it it's like when you do kind of rise above that, it's almost like the exceptional people are even even more exceptional in a lot of ways because right. of all the opposition they face and have to overcome to kind of be where they are. But it sounds like you have a good community in the army itself. Right. Even though a lot of the a lot of the world would be very specifically invested in you not succeeding there. Right. Right. There'd be there'd be people who are who are part of the Southern Middle Eastern community who who like want you to fail. There'd be people on the right wing who'd want you to fail. There'd be people on the left wing who'd want you to fail. There's all sorts of reasons that people would not want you to succeed in what you're doing. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's got to be it's got to be a lot of pressure. And I have, you know, going in the military, I've had these events where I was bullied. I'm not going to lie. And my whole, you know, chain of command, no. And it's in my paper. It's my every report that I made. But I was bullied by individuals, not by the army. Mm-hmm. I was bullied by... 18 year olds that just signed up to go to the military with this 35 year old Mm -hmm. mature female so it was very intimidating it still is very intimidating my higher ups the people that I report to that are 22 and 23 and I'm 36 so there's a huge gap in the age and as we were still in training because they haven't really finished and succeeded and became soldiers yet their mentality is still like you know I just came out of mom and dad's house I don't want another mom telling me what to do. And I came off like that. Mm -hmm. I came off authoritative because I told my battle buddies to my right and left to do the right thing. So let alone all of these obstacles that I had to overcome, being in the military itself at this age was a huge obstacle. And I got bullied a lot for that. You know, I was thinking that I'm trying to show off just because I was very squared away, like we use in the military. But once I graduated and you know we all became soldiers and we wore the patch and we got sent to our different you know um pcs and to different units and bases they have realized that that's not cool and that's not a thing and it's just your rank and your job is what matters not your age or ethnicity or where you come from but yeah like it was just any more obstacles anyone wants to throw at you (laughs) might as well so what so, so do you feel like um, religion for you kind of takes the pressure off or do you think it kind of um, almost escalates the pressure or a bit of both? In the military? Yeah, just for, just for your life, right? That if you think about standing in front of God one day, does that, do you find that mostly comforting or do you find that mostly, okay, I've really, really, really got to get this stuff right and represent this well where I am? Um. I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's how you view it. You know, growing up, I wasn't this religious, but faith is what got me through basic training. Basic training is, is really hard. It's it's a mental breakdown. Um, they break us as civilians and rebuild us as soldiers. So our mentality is completely different. And I'm not going to lie, this was a huge experience for me that opened up my eyes to a lot of different things and made me even a little bit more closer to God and um, I don't know if people know this about myself but I've finished the Quran twice in military basic training and I have not finished the Quran once in my whole entire life so and, and, I, and, and I think that's what they say it's you need something to hold on to uh, either family or religion or your kids or whoever it is to get through this you know really tough mental uh, part of the training aside from the physical and religion is what got me through it. And I became, alhamdulillah, I became a lot more closer. So for me, it's it's definitely a, a push and it's not a burden at all. 
So, so what would you say the foundation of your personal faith is, right? Because I think for a lot of Muslims, it is the community. But it seems like it's more than that for you. For me, it's definitely more than that. For me, it's the connection between me and my faith. Um, because from our conversation, you probably you know got a little a, a good idea about how I interact with the community, and and I'm always in a defensive right um, stage. Even though I try to be as calm as you know relatable as possible, it's it's always like I'm always on guard for that. So um, the way we were raised, we were brought to the culture and religion or to the religion differently and it was through the culture it's like you can't do this it's taboo you can't do this is frowned upon but it wasn't you can't do this because this has bad consequences on you or this because this it's you know it's just not a good ethical way to do it so we were just brought up in more of a cultural infused religion rather than the actual pure religion itself so here's a question then for both the person trying to understand Islam from the outside and the Muslim who's grown up in a culture who thinks how who wants to understand the religion apart from culture how do you do that like how how do, where do you find that information what kind of research do you need to do what kind of search do you need to have to figure that out it's in my experience in my opinion it's very hard it's very hard. I think the source, the good thing about our Quran is it's still its purest form. It hasn't been altered or changed. Um, I think whoever needs to, again, I'll refer to something of my experience. So in the military, excuse me, as I started reading the Quran, and, and I would read it at odd hours where we're allowed... We, so we go to sleep at 9 o'clock at night, like 8.50, we're all supposed to be in bed. Um, all lights are off. It's a huge bay with like 60 females, you know, bunk beds and all that lovely stuff. And I would actually be under my covers with a flashlight, breaking rules, you know, because my personal time is usually an hour before bed and it's just for personal hygiene and you really barely do anything. You can do, you know, PT, some exercise on your own. So... Or I get up and I go to the hallway when it's my fire guard duty. So every hour there are two people has to be guarding the building in case of a fire. So I asked and they told me it's okay. So I, I you know, do my wudu. I sit down with my Quran and I read. And as I was reading, I actually started reading to understand. So I read it in the past. Mm -hmm. Reading to just read and scan through. Right. And I realize as you're reading, and I read about 30 pages, average about 30 pages an hour. As I was reading, and I'll get to a certain point, I, f I start drifting in my thoughts. And then I wake myself up, and I'm like, no. And I go back to the last page, and I try to remember the story of where I left it. So um, there are a lot of resources for th the, the Quran explanations, the Fsir al-Quran, and basically breaking down those stories, all events that happen, and trying to learn the um, the story behind those suar and those chapters in there. So just to go and learn from what you see is cultural or how people practice is not the right way to do it because it's unfortunate that people are contradicting themselves and, and you know they don't practice what they preach. They'll do something and then they, you'll just go and completely contradict it by doing something else and it's very poisonous and it's sad. So it takes all of us to actually you know try to do the right thing the right way, the Quran way by doing it to portray that to other non-Muslims who wanted to or interested in, in getting to know it or at least getting to have a relationship with Muslims that we all have to do our jobs the right way, not the cultural way. So talking about tafsir literature, even there, right, you've got a whole range of different things to choose from. Right. Where are you personally going to find what you think is kind of good tafsir literature? So... There are some different madahib. So basically, you have the, the Hanafi way, you have the Maliki way, you have the Shafi'i way. I still don't understand the difference between all three of them. Mm -hmm. I grew up, my, you know, my father told me we're Hanafi, and that's how we practice. And, you know, there are different madahib. Um, 
they they do. Honestly, I don't know, to be like really frank with you, but um, that'll I'll challenge people to actually go and read them and see the difference and try to refer always back to Quran because it is the main source of all of those different uh, subdivisions that comes out of it. So when when you look at all this stuff, would you say it is purely the Quran making you decide, or do you feel like you kind of have this? living moral compass inside you which can kind of which aids in your reading of the quran and how you kind of figure out okay this tradition here i don't think is grounded in anything versus this other one which this makes sense absolutely it is the moral compass it is the the nature we were all born with that you know with that nature the sense of doing the thing the right thing and the way we were raised it changes that like kids don't know about fire until they burn their finger or when it comes to um, racism kids don't see colors as parents we were actually let them let them them know that this person is here is black versus brown versus white versus yellow or culturally so there is this moral compass what well, nicely put by the way the way you said it for leading us to actually figure out what is right and what is wrong and what works with us but you definitely still do need um the guidelines from there but the the brain and the human brain is amazing of understanding and trying to wrap around all of this stuff but you really have to have it with open mind and open mentality like and it's it's a difficult balance right because this is something that islam and christianity don't quite share but they almost share right because what you're talking about is they're called the fitra, right? That everyone is born in the state of fitra, and, fitra then, it's, yes. and then it's their upbringing that kind of channel is their the, like the hadith the, is the, either in Masahu and Asru, so they become Christian or become yeah, or Sabians or yeah, you know, so so that's that's in the hadith, that's in hadith, yes. Bukhari, I believe, and so so Christianity. It doesn't believe in that specifically. It wouldn't believe everyone's born a Christian, but whatever, everyone's made in the what we call the Imago Dei, which means the image of God. And we have a sense of God in us, but we also have a sin nature in us, the kind of intrinsic to us. So we suppress truth as well, right? So it's not all, not everything that comes out of our heart is good, and not and and some of it is is good, right? It's the Imago Dei, but it's also the sin nature. And what all of us do by nature, and it's kind of a human tendency, is we see something we know is wrong, and we just kind of like choose to rationalize it right. away, right? I was like, okay, I know that's not good, but I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna. That's not convenient right now, right. so I'm gonna, <laughs> so I'm gonna do that, and and I think that. And the, the more you're willing to do that in your life, the darker path that leads to an individual and a civilization as well. So I've been thinking about this with the whole um, with the whole kind of uh, protest movement going on right now. Because obviously there's some legitimate concerns in that. But I also see people who I know defending some things that should not be defended. Hmm. And I keep having the conversation that the impulse where you see your friend say something crazy, like like uh, violence against police officers is justified, for example, right? Right. And, and you don't correct that because you're afraid of you don't want to alienate your friend, right? Right. You know there's something not right about that statement or that attitude, but you don't correct it because, okay, well, they're having a painful moment. That right there is the exact same impulse that would stop you confronting racism if you saw it. Absolutely. Like courage and honesty are the kind of things that are important in every single circumstances with people who are on our team, especially, and people on the other team. And it starts with us individuals. It right. really does. Right. A absolutely. Jesus says, before you see the speck in your brother's eye first remove the plank from your own eye so i think so often we want to look at the world by thinking, okay what's what's wrong out there and i'll get to me last right right and, and so that's what tribalism does it i'm great 
my tribe are good, and that everyone else they're they're the bad guys, right? So you tend to, we tend to be blind to ourselves and blind to those immediately around us, and that just gets us in this cycle of dishonesty and suppression of truth. Absolutely, and it takes that you know, it builds the pressure, and it takes that one straw to to break, and I get that question a lot. Um, they think because we're MPs, we're the ones. Like we're the we're the ones with the military vehicles in the street. I'm like, no, these are national guards. They get activated on state emergency. We are the big army. We don't have anything to do with that. But that strikes a conversation of like, what do you think it's going on? How do you you know? How do you? What is your own input or thought about it? And and I actually I stay away from this whole conversation. I tell them I'm like, I can't. It's my opinions right now. It just cannot be input because. You guys are viewing me as the military, and anything that I'm gonna say, it's going to represent the military. Um, when maybe if I'm my civilian and I have the right, you know, First Amendment and to say my opinion and protest or or whatever, join a movement, then I will have my own. But to generalize it, I tell them, I say, "What's wrong is wrong." We're not gonna sit here and sugarcoat it. I am part of law enforcement, even though I'm in a different sector, but. I defend the 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 people and the weak and the people in distress and what's wrong is wrong. You cannot um, abuse the power. You can't. That's just not something that you can do and you shouldn't do it. But there's also, you know, being um, portrayed that way or being instigated that way and then as soon as something goes off, that's the only thing that the camera is catching. They're not catching the events that led to it. And it's, you know, it's in, in everything. Like, bring it back again to my humble self. To look. You haven't seen the things that I faced for me to make that decision and actually say, I want to be law enforcement and I want to join the military and the U.S. Army. You haven't seen all the little events that happened to me, all the racism that happened within my within my, my race. And, and I tell them, I said, for you to... Look at me and X me out just because I'm wearing the uniform when I have a you know American flag on my shoulder. You're being racist towards me. You haven't heard me. You haven't seen my story. You haven't even known why I'm in there. Right off the bat, I'm you know this spy that has sold my country and sold my religion to. And I said, and it's not the case. So we have to be able to communicate and hear the other people. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And I just always been you know my motto all my life give someone the benefit of that let them ex- express themselves don't that the eye wants to believe what the eye wants to believe and you can't believe anything that i see right right that's one of if you read the the torah right and the law written by moses that's that's the the presumption of innocence of others is the is one of the foundational keys to the law right one is proportional punishment the cr- punishment fits the crime but also the presumption of innocence. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not just a legal thing, that should be a cultural thing as well. It really should be. That any individual we look at, we're, we're, we're asking questions rather than accusing people. Yeah. Give, them, give them the benefit of the doubt, at least. Yeah. So I, I, I want to do this uh, two ways. Uh, what do you think America could, could learn from Middle Eastern culture? And then we'll do it the other way around as well. America can learn from Middle Eastern culture. Um, it's a really tough one. <laughs> I'm being really honest. Only because they have been learning the, the wrong things. Because mm-hmm. it starts with the Middle Easterns actually doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Excuse me. And trying to... I mean, with each generation coming, they're unfortunately, they're letting go a little bit at a time of... The religion and doing the right thing i can't really say the culture but yes with being so westernized and being so out there and being open and you know what happened in the middle east and pushed all these young generations to um to go to different western part of the world they're letting go of that so for america to learn from the middle eastern the middle easterns have to first hold on to their values and hold on to the cultural uh, beliefs and hold on to religion, maybe we could paint a better picture mm-hmm. for Americans. Um, 
I will answer your next question. What's the Middle Easterns going to learn from Americans? Um, it, it goes both ways, you know, with all of this happening with the protests and, and it's they're losing track. It's, going, it's getting out of hand. We need to just calm down, reset, almost hit a reset button and do the right thing. I think a little bit of it's it's easier here for me than if I stayed this whole lifeline of mine in the Middle East because there is a little bit of freedom. There is freedom of speech. Um, we're a little bit more respected here. I mean, we have integrity. We have we are in separate entities here. While in the Middle East, it's you know we're not at that level yet. Yeah, they say democracy, but who are we kidding? It's it's still a dictatorship. That's in a lot of those countries. So to learn from the Western is to do the right thing, um, to respect and be respected. And the Americans can, you know, or this part of the world can learn from the Middle Easterns is also to, we have that bond. So in the Middle East, regardless, family is a huge thing. Um, here they just tend to want to be 18 and leave the parents' nest and fly and it's not they don't have that dynamic as much as Middle Eastern. So mm -hmm. that's a beautiful thing. Uh, love and respect and, and and all of those things that, you know, we have no racism almost in, in the Middle East of different religions and, and and all of that forgiveness. So they definitely can learn from that. And it is on us, Arab Americans, that we come here at younger age, um, or we're born here. It's on the parents to actually still um, implant those little seeds in us to, to, to do all of that and represent. At the end of the day, everyone in this unit in the United States, everyone came from a different part of the world, even if they've been here for generations. So there's always this beautiful thing that they're holding on to their culture, either their food or certain habits or certain, certain things they do. So we'll just bring it all together and we can all live happy um, culturally and religiously if we just respect and praise that the, I, I agree with you on the on the family aspect and the hospitality aspect as well my favorite my favorite COVID-19 moment actually was I uh, I have an Afghani friend and I was lending him some video games that I'd finished playing and I went I got to I got to his house and he met me at the porch and said hey I, thanks for this I won't you know, get close to you. All right. This whole in, thing changed now. He he works in the um, ER department in um, Swedish Edmonds, and he's he's kind of being very kind of cautious, and, and he's not really at risk. I'm not really at risk. Right. But then his father comes out. He says, "Anwar, your friend is here. Invite him in." <laughs> of course. <laughs> like, in my culture, we uh, when your friend is here, you, you bring have him to in, bring him. <laughs> <laughs> it was during Ramadan, so they made me lunch even while I weren't eating. Yeah. So which was which was which was beautiful. Yeah. It was it was this kind of great moment, and I try and embody some of some of this in. And we're huggers too, so yeah, yeah. it's so hard in the Corona life right now, where everyone has to keep a distance. You know, they keep six feet distance from within their feet, but then they'll still come and hug you. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. That's that's separate. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I love that, but it's almost. It's like, it's almost like the bad stuff about the Middle East is almost... Overpowering. Um, no, no, it's not this overpowering. It's almost like it's the dark side of that family connection. Oh, I see. So, so if you think about how Middle Eastern culture typically works, right, you have no separation between religion, family, and government. Right. Right, all those things go into one, right? So the same thing that makes people, you know, take care of their family... Is like you know when you're when you're the leader of a country, it's like uh, my my brother's son is slow and can't get a job anywhere. Let's make him a general. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like there, there's a good impulse, but if you don't have the ability to kind of like separate categories of what people are supposed to do, then it's very difficult to advance in the world. And that yeah. and, and so it means that kind of families looking after each other means people outside of that system may get left out and it's not a meritocracy as much as would benefit the society right uh, it's it's interesting yeah it's 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 really interesting 
to watch. So talk to talk to the average say Christian American, right? Let's say they like Middle Eastern culture, they see the issues with it. And the temptation is just to be cynical and critical. But how do you think people can engage in a way that's actually beneficial to the Middle East? Not to engage as an enemy right. with criticism, but actually to engage as a friend. Which means you're not blind, but you also don't hate. You mean here in this uh, this part of the world? or Yeah, sure. Here, or, or anywhere. Or here or anywhere in the world, right? So let's say you want to... It could be, you know, you go to Syria and start a business there or, you know, what, whatever you think is, is helpful. How does this conversation need to move forward? Um, definitely working with each other. So uh, on a quick note with that, they, they tell me, you know, they point fingers of why I joined the U.S. Army. I'm like, but any other job, you work here, you're working with Christians, you're working with Catholics, you're working with jewish you know my boss i had a boss who was jewish and i'm muslim we never took christmas off he was like you don't have an excuse i don't <laughs> we left it off and we did work christmas for that so it, it, it's not just that one thing but like you said they they're they're almost want to just criticize right off the bat it's it's just easier to criticize you feel at power you feel you have the upper hand when unfortunately you put people down and that just you know, one of the human nature. But yeah, like, let's work together. Let's look past these racism um, or movements or these little small-minded and, you know, box-minded of the culture that may some of us have been raised with and then they just generalize it. Just work with, you know, each other and, and having more meetings and having more events and uh, creating more awareness like I take this upon myself and I challenge everyone who is listening and watching to take it also upon themselves and start a movement start an event like let's get together and have fun and you know and, and talk about these subjects um, it's it's more awkward to bring it up but once it's out on the table I think it just it, it'll be a little bit easier with the social media everyone has this platform and can voice um, their concerns and beliefs and 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 just we have to be able to digest it the same way instead of just being able to say something sharp and not take the criticism either i think that if if we're people that claim to believe in an all-powerful god right fear should be the last thing from our minds so i think living in a place like seattle in a time like this more than anything we're living in a culture of fear Absolutely. The people are afraid of other people, but they're also terrified of saying the wrong thing. And I don't think fear makes the world a better place. Courage does. I mean, not always, but usually courage does, right? Absolutely. And I tell them I'm brutally honest all the time, but I'd rather be honest and feel at ease and be able to put my head on the pillow at the end of the day, knowing that I've done the right thing, knowing that I've done my best at it is better than just trying to tell you a sugar credit, trying to tell you what you want to hear, you know? And people tell me, they're like, you're trying to sugarcoat the military. I'm like, no, I'm not. Why would I want to do that? I'm already working for them. I don't need to try to, you know, please you or try to have you approve of me um, to come around and I'm just really stating the facts. I'm just saying it as it is. And I'm trying to change the little things that are wrong about it from both pers perspectives. Well, good on you for not sitting back as a critic, but actually engaging in the work, engaging in the conversation. Absolutely. And coming to the table to make stuff happen. So thank you for being here today. And thank you guys for listening to the Almeida Initiative podcast. We will be back next week.